One of the problems with this crisis is that has been denied again and again, uh, was financial, but then suddenly was not only financial, became industrial, became a crisis of employment, and then became a fiscal crisis, and then a government crisis, and then a European crisis. So all this evolution of the crisis, what we in some of our papers call the metamorphosis of the crisis, and required deep analytical work in real time, and that's how and the aftermath network of very leading intellectuals and researchers was created to meet once a year in Lisbon, do some research, uh, do a lot of thinking. I invited people who were outstanding from the intellectual point of view, people who were very independent, not paid by bankers and not paid by governments to do this work. We don't think as standard economies, and we don't think, in fact, as a standard social scientist. We think out of the box. And we try to innovate out of necessity to understand the crisis in very different terms. The era of easy credit, the era of living on debt, and enjoying the moment, the carpe diem of the economy, has ended. So this is the aftermath of carpe diem. I remember very distinctly being invited by Manuel Castells, who organized the, the network. Uh, I was visiting him in the Los Angeles area in the spring of 2009. And, you know, everybody, the stock markets were still really low, and everybody was worrying just about, you know, would I have work? Would I have a job? Can I keep up with my payments? And, and he invited me to join this group of, of people to think about this crisis. And at that time, I remember it seemed like such a relief to know that there would be a group of people to talk to and try to understand what's going on. It affected me like so many others because there were um, reductions in pension plans and savings and so forth. So there was some money or housing prices. So I own a house in the United States um, and it was worth less after the housing market went through the crisis than before. So there's that kind of personal impact. And then, of course, I made the decision to try to shift my attention to do some work on the crisis. And the crisis doesn't belong just to financial rating agencies or Goldman Sachs or big corporations, but belongs to culture and society. Only now, I believe, three to four years after the beginning of the crisis, politicians are beginning to understand that following the rules of the game that are set by the IMF and the European Union and by the Central European Bank won't be enough to solve the crisis. The medicine that they are proposing for the disease actually is even killing the patient more. Back in 2007, 2008, 
it was a crisis that seemed to take place in the city of London or in Wall Street, and it was all very strange. You know, it was very uh, people didn't understand what was going on because it was these very curious financial instruments that people had never heard of, credit default swaps. What on earth are those? They didn't make any sense to people, but now it makes sense to people because it affects their income. It affects their jobs. It affects the conditions under which their children can get education. It affects their ability to go to a library because the library is about to be closed. It impinges directly on their lives. And now they understand what the crisis means. This is where we are today, in a very uncertain place, not in the aftermath of a crisis, but in the midst of one, where the beginning can be analyzed and documented with some precision, but where the end is not yet in sight and the outcome by no means clear. I can certainly remember walking into the center of Cambridge one day in September 2007 and seeing a long queue of people in the street wondering what exactly they were queuing for and realizing that they were queuing outside the door of Northern Rock, the bank that had previously the night before requested uh, a safety net from the Bank of England in terms of uh, um, backing up its precarious financial position. And it was my first witnessing of a classic bank run of people afraid that their money might be lost. So what did you feel at that moment? Some anxiety, some worry, some uncertainty about um, savings more generally, including my own. Uh, it was probably the only, I, that I can remember, the only moment in my life when I have seriously begun to wonder whether something that I had always taken for granted, which is that when you put money in a bank, it's safe, uh, was a unreliable assumption. That is, I wondered whether, in fact, it was perhaps not safe, and that a traditional set of assumptions that we all have, which are that institutions like banks are reliable institutions that you can trust, these assumptions were called into question. crisis has metamorphosed. What was apparently a financial crisis in 2007-2008, a seizing up of the banking system, the credit crunch, has become a full-blown political crisis because states have become directly involved in sorting out the financial crisis and therefore the burden has been shifted onto states and governments. It's also a social crisis because in order to respond to these demands that states now face, states are dependent on private investors and they have to satisfy the conditions of private investors. In order to do that, they have to clamp down on their public spending and they have to try to raise taxes. And this impinges directly on the lives of millions of ordinary citizens who feel that their life conditions are now being threatened. And they are responding to that with anger, with resentment, with protest. And they, one of the common refrains you hear, whether it's in Greece or Britain or Spain or Portugal, is we are being asked to pay the price for a crisis caused by others. That is, the bankers caused the crisis and we are being asked to pick up the bill, is how many people feel. And are they right? Are they paying the bill for the banks? To some extent, they are. It is highly hypocritical to come down 
disproportionately hard on somebody who has stolen a bottle of water costing £3.50 from somebody who has lost billions of pounds. And what we want to see as community members is fair, equitable treatment. Governments and politicians are now in the front line of the crisis and they face enormous challenges, trapped by the Faustian pact that ties their fate to private investors while at the same time facing the wrath of citizens who feel unfairly treated and betrayed. What happens on the streets of Athens and other cities may be as important in the months to come as what happens in the offices of governments and banks in New York, Washington, London, Brussels, Berlin and elsewhere. The biggest thing right now, just to seize on it, is the worry of citizens that states are responding to global financial institutions. They are responding to investment banks. They are responding to insurance companies. They are responding to credit markets, to rating agencies like Moody's, but not to the needs of ordinary citizens. So there is a widespread distrust. The distrust of anything governments or institutions do that ha can have many different expressions. But this is at the heart of the problem. And we are finding empirically in all our analysis that that's what's going on. It's like, uh, the, yes, there is the crisis, but it's not the traditional thing. There is a crisis, and there is a crisis of social services, and there is a crisis of employment, and therefore people are uh, hit by the crisis. No, suddenly they see that all their life, when it comes into question, they don't have any instrument because they don't trust the guys that should be in charge of, protect, of protecting them, of steering them out of the crisis, and then they are orphans at that point. And in, I think that, that element that you mentioned. At the first sight, it appears to be a global crisis all over the world. Then it is global, but not global. This is fascinating. Today, we are living in a world where Latin America, tomorrow maybe Africa, of course China and India, are big centers. We are not in a, in a pure American or Euro-American hegemony. So this is one very important aspect of this crisis. What is clear and for me obvious is that many people today have the feeling that they don't know where we are going to. Personally, I don't like the idea that the system is collapsing and that we don't know what is the system, that the system is something very abstract. No. You have people, you have actors, you have bankers, you have people that live on finance, you have people that organize this financial system. So I think, I would not say that the, the system, the, an abstract system is collapsing. And uh, the truth is it is not at all collapsing because it recovered very quickly. No, I think that we should much more try to see who are the actors. Many of us know people that work in a bank, or, but we don't have a very clear image of what, what it is. And we don't have exactly a very precise image of how these people make money. What do they want? What do they expect from life? And who are these people? How do they live? Anthropologists could tell us how these people live. It would be very interesting, how they work. What, what is their conception of life? We know very little about the dominant. And maybe this is why we call this the system. When you don't know exactly who are the actors, you give a, a very abstract and general uh, branding to what they do. So my position is that we should transform the image of a system it, into the image of actors. Faced by failure of credit, they have proposed only the lending of more money stripped of the lure of profit by which to induce our people to follow their false leadership, they have resorted to exhortations, pleading carefully for restored confidence. They only know the rules of a generation of self-seekers. They have no vision, and when there is no vision, the people perish. It, with the Great Depression, you had two main solutions. On the one hand, the New Deal in America. On the other hand, in Italy and in uh, Germany, Nazism, fascism. So, of course, we see nationalist movements developing. Of course, we see some people saying, 
We have to go back to something like the New Deal. We have to think about Keynes and so on, Keynesian ideas. But what is very important is that we have new social movement, new social actors that say we want, uh, for different reasons, we want to bring some different answers to this crisis. Construction work on water conservation projects requires an immense number of skilled and unskilled workers providing immediate employment for hundreds of those who would otherwise be on relief. Those who suffered because of the drought are now employed on projects designed for their own future benefit. Thus, the works program answers the need of both the individual and the community. There is a very famous uh, book for sociologists which was written in the very, very early 30s uh, about a small city in Austria with, with the name is uh, uh, Marienthal. It's a small city which had a very important uh, industry and a strong social democratic political party. Then the crisis came, then the people lost their job, they did not become violent. They become unable to do anything. They become, you know, terribly tired, to say it like. And then a few years after, but this is not in the book, some of them became Nazi and so. So violence can come, but it is not necessarily. You don't have an automatic determinism between a crisis and violence. Today we don't know. Many people are, have the feeling that their children will maybe live worse, in, in much worse conditions. And, and we don't know. So what happens when you are losing all these elements that gave a, a certain meaning to your life? Some people say, no, a, a, it's, a world is ending and I don't have any ID. Other people say, oh, I have one ID, my nation, and they become strongly nationalist. Uh, some other people say, I will try to find in myself resources in order to build a new life through my own subjectivity. You have different answers in a moment when it is true that many people have the feeling that something is ending. In our work here in Lisbon, we decipher our time as we live it, prophesying as we decipher while all too aware that the end is all around us. So why should we pay special attention to the crisis? Why did we set up a group to explore its implications? I propose that our less than conscious motivation for doing so was a sense of the ending, a sense that this crisis is not routine, but one of many whose reinforcing interactions are reshaping the historical life world. If I think of myself historically, you know, I was born in the USA just towards the end of World War II. So I have lived through arguably the richest, you know, most powerful uh, situation in the world that has ever been. I mean, in terms of uh, medical care, you know, wealth, uh, expanding hopes. Uh, it's not just in Europe, it's the 30 glorious years. It was also in post-war US. So, you know, as a parent, I am fully aware that that's not going to be what my children live through. Their historical time is going to be different, and it's not going to be so favorable. Uh, most of us have grown up with a view of history as progress. So I think that image of history as a line that gets better is now coexisting with another image of history, which is more like um, if you were standing next to a pond and you were throwing rocks into the pond, and each rock is a problem, it's a crisis, it's a system that's not working, or something that's melting down, or something, it could be an earthquake, it could be a tsunami, it could be an oil spill in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. There's all sorts of uh, episodes that are always happening, political, economic, environmental, and they don't get better. They just have spreading circles that intersect with the circles spreading from other problem areas, and that's another view of history, almost as a network of crises. And it's not yet at the end of the world. We're not talking about a, you know, the final fall of anything. But it's like all the time there's some set of problems that uh, may get a little better, but they don't go away. Some leak or seepage or pollution or poisoning starts, 
and it just keeps going, so it's not over in a, in a moment of devastation. In my paper, I, I refer to it as a rolling apocalypse. It's in our lives, and it keeps going. I suggested this short film by Guillaume Marcondes. The film shows a clearly unnatural tiger because it's a, it's a puppet, and you can see the puppeteers. It's a clearly unnatural creation, and the thing about the film that spoke to me was that the line between what humans are doing in the world, you know, you just can't draw a line, and also the sense of threat by this beast with big, big teeth, very scary beast. But there are people running or operating this piece. For the first time in centuries, except during the period of wars, we do not see the light at the end of the tunnel. We became afraid of the future. Tomorrow will be worse than today. And the markets make sure that today is the day. This fear of harming ourselves, right, which is installed, it's being installed, you know, it's creeping in, makes us fear the future. So, we are, in fact, losing this idea of the future. Yeah, because you're a physicist by training, right? Yes, um, I'm a nuclear physicist. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I watched, you know, all, all the, you know, this, this rise of techno-science and so on, and... Uh, but you think the role of science has declined? No, no, no. Yeah. On the contrary, the role of science is ever more important. All the instruments we have to survive like all these uh, electronic networks, uh, computers and so on, they are all based on fundamental research. And in the future, it will be more and more so. But what sort of science? When science starts to be so important for the, uh, the economy, the old type of science of the past uh, 400 years, the science that was curiosity-driven, starts to be pushed aside. The science we see today, is not the old science that we have in the books and so on. It's techno science. It's science that has an ultimate aim, which is to produce technology. We have uh, tilted the balance between what we have built and the rest of the given world. The balance has been really shifted. This is an interesting problem in history. There's no word or concept to name that shift of balance. I mean, people are trying, they talk about the age of the Anthropocene is one way of, of naming this, this change of balance. I call it human empire. And like any empire, it's, it's hard to run. It doesn't just run itself, but we dominate the world as a species as never before. I'm interested in how advertising works to brand the crisis as an inevitable obstacle in the progressive march of capitalism, one that individuals are asked as both a moral and a national obligation to overcome. What better way for the U.S. to reestablish trust for consumers than to position the crisis as a brand?
in the 21st century, I think that what brands do is um, more than advertising. They go beyond advertising to establish the fact that, that the crisis was something that was inevitable. In other words, it was just a moment in the progress, the great progress of capitalism. And so what individual consumers need to do is figure out a way individually, not with help by the state or by the government or anything else, but individually figure out a way to rescue not only the crisis, but rescue themselves from the crisis. So it becomes this, you know, brands use the crisis as a moment of opportunity. Um, to regain trust, to regain loyalty, and to regain capitalism. America, center of equal daughters, equal sons, all, all alike and do. So the Levi's campaign focuses on a city in Pennsylvania, Braddock. It's lost 90% of its population since 2008, since or since the, two, the steel industry has kind of collapsed in the U.S. So one of the ads starts with um, a kind of neon sign that's flickering because it's broken and it says America and, and it's like literally sinking into a pool of water, right? And that's the opening shot of the ad. And the ending shot of the ad is the America sign out of the water, brightly lit, apparently fixed, Right, and so um, this campaign used the poetry of Walt Whitman. It's kind of scratchy, nostalgic recording of O oh, Pioneers. It tried to tap into that same kind of, you know, it, you know the, poet, the poem itself says it, you know, this is what we do. We seize the, the world, right? This is, you know, what we do. We go out there and work. We're not afraid. We're strong. We're mighty, you know, um, and it uses that. Now, interestingly, some people found that the, the effort, the use of Walt Whitman was too over the top. So Levi's next ad actually went to Braddock, Pennsylvania and filmed real people. We were taught how the pioneers went into the West. The voiceover and the Levi's ad is a child's voice. So, you know, immediately invokes innocence, purity, you know, that kind of childlike um, joy and wonder. A long time ago, things got broken here. People got sad and left. Maybe the world breaks on purpose. So we can have work to do. This child says in the ad, something got broken here and we need to fix it. And so it's kind of stunning in its abstraction, right? That it wasn't corporate greed. It wasn't the failure of banks. It wasn't banks, you know, hoodwinking, you know, the working people. Just something got broken, right? So it absolutely abstracts the crisis out of any kind of individual blame or, or institutional blame or state blame and says something got broken and then immediately says, but we need to fix it and then invokes the language of the frontier. People say that there are no more frontiers, but there are frontiers all around us, right? That's what the voiceover says. So it uses the economic crisis as another frontier to kind of recast and rebrand the crisis. People think there aren't frontiers anymore. They can't see how frontiers are all around us. They capitalize on this post-crisis wasteland chic, right? Um, and fear and anger on the part of citizens, but then also offer a recuperative message. The trick is that the recuperative message is directed at the individual worker, not at, not at anywhere else, not at institutional um, revolt or institutional reform, not at state reform, but the individual. It's up to the individual. It's very clear in these ads that that's what they're saying. Okay. 
I got a question for you. What does this city know about luxury? Huh? What does a town that's been to hell and back know about the finer things in life? Well, I'll tell you, more than most. You see, it's the hottest fires that make the hardest steel. I saw the Chrysler Super Bowl ad when I was watching the Super Bowl. And it's an ad that is an homage to Detroit. It uses the hip hop singer Eminem in his song, Lose Yourself. And the ad just was absolutely about rebranding really three things. Rebranding the city of Detroit, rebranding the brand of Chrysler itself, which is one of the big three automobile companies, one of the first companies to ask for federal bailout money from the US government. Um, and rebranding capitalism. This is the Motor City, and this is what we do. The YouTube video right now has 12 million views. It's cynical and it's hypocritical. It's not only that they've spent $9 million on this ad after asking for $15 billion um, in bailout money, but also the automobile industries in Detroit in general have been, have discouraged diversification of the economy there, which is one reason why, you know, when they crashed, no one had a job. Why is it so successful? It's about kind of a simpler time. It's about, um, you know, it's rebranding capitalism as you know, the thing, the thing it used to be, right, in this nostalgic frame and saying, this is what we have to do now. Come, my tan-faced children. Follow well in order. Get your weapons ready. Have you your pistols? Have you your sharp-edged axes, pioneers, oh pioneers? We debouch upon a newer, mightier world, varied world, fresh and strong the world we seize. Pioneers, oh pioneers. The state is set for a very serious confrontation, but not necessarily, actually, I would say not a violent confrontation, because people have understood one thing. Uh, politics today is played out in the minds of the people through you, through the media. This is the critical thing. And the one thing that delegitimizes any action is violence. That's why governments always try to provoke violence. My point is that Europe is in a process of social turmoil that is going to be increasingly radicalized in the coming few years, months and years. Um, in this process, uh, if there's no a development of hopeful movements, it will be a development of hatred movements. And therefore, the, the confrontation between the culture of hope and the culture of destructive nostalgia is probably the most important trend in the aftermath of the crisis. This idea that this is not a crisis, this is a trick. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, on the trick part, uh, there is, it is a crisis. It is a crisis in, in economic terms, but the crisis, uh, it, uh, in fact, uh, has been used uh, to improve the uh, power and the profits of the financial uh, groups, which are, in fact, the leading elite in our society. Uh, all the major banks and financial institutions in the last year have reported extraordinary profits. But now the governments are in a fiscal crisis. The government need the money, and the banks say, well, in order to be uh, stable, in order to uh, not to go back into our trouble, uh, we cannot lend it to you. And in fact, the only way we are going to lend something to someone, in, if you start cutting wages, uh, firing workers, uh, curtailing social rights, and eliminating the, the collective bargaining power of the unions. So in that sense, the trick part of the statement 
um, seems to be empirically supported because profits are hugely up. Uh, some of the Spanish banks have reported the largest profits in history uh, in, in, in 2010. And at the same time, the, the condition had been created for an assault on the welfare state, on social rights, on the on labor union pa power, and in fact on all the institutions that were uh, uh, constructing people's life uh, in terms of, the, of their basic needs. So um, if it is, I, I don't think it's necessarily a conspiracy of the capitalist class to organize this, but ultimately is being used in those terms. So in the perception of people, this is obviously a trick. I argue that economic globalization has progressed with tremendous speed, but politics and the media have remained primary national. So we have this kind of global capital, and then we have national and international organizations that are trying to respond to this crisis caused by the movement of capital globally. I think the trust is in question and uh, people distrust these organizations. They see very clearly that these organizations are unable to solve the crisis. And politicians and governments offer national solutions to global problems and people can see that. And what people can remember is something that is connected to nationalism. Even if they distrust national organizations, they do recognize what nationalism is. And politicians are very clever. They play with the concept of nationalism. And so do journalists. So when there is a global crisis, how it is being framed um, by the media is that um, there is one nation state against the other. Greeks are being labelled lazy by Finns who think they are better and, and it's always somebody else's fault. It's not, you know, it's not our fault, it's your fault. And the rhetoric, I think, is, is really nasty at the moment. Always blame the other always playing the one who is not like us. And I think this is why nationalism is so popular. And it's interesting that nationalism is so popular even if national institutions are not. On tehty poliittista historiaa, hyvät ystävät. Te olette ollut tekemässä sitä. Tämä on yhteisen työn tulos. Meitä kohtaa nyt uudet haasteet. Me olemme valmiita. Me olemme nousseet pienestä ilman suurta rahaa, suurella sydämellä, suurella työllä. The question is really that the organizations are, are behind both national and international organizations and they are trying to solve these issues that are so complicated and people feel lost and perhaps they go back to 
communities. Perhaps they go back to their own localities. Perhaps they um, establish their own communities. Perhaps they, um, they exchange their views on the internet or use social media because they feel that there's no organization that represents their interests at the moment. So I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic here. Todos estem amoïnats i indignats pel panorama polític, econòmic i social que veiem al nostre voltant, per la corrupció dels polítics, empresaris, banquers, per la indefensió dels ciutadans. For millions of people in Europe and North America, the economic crisis that unfolded since 2008 has shaken the foundations of their lives. Suddenly, employment became uncertain. Credit was restricted to a few. Consumption reduced to the essentials. Social services deeply cut. And a dark cloud engulfed the future of their children, reversing the pattern of high expectations for the next generation. So what happened in Spain as a response to the crisis? Well, uh, the most important thing that has happened is uh, this movement of the indignance that is a spontaneous movement that started on the internet by calling people to demonstrate one week before the municipal elections as a protest against the emptiness of the electoral debates in the municipal campaign in which parties, uh, both conservatives and socialists, but almost all other parties as well, uh, were just talking uh, about their old problems, about themselves. They were blaming each other for the crisis, no one proposing solutions, and always trying to find the slogans to capture the vote without really providing any serious uh, alternative, and not actually self-criticizing the failed policies of, of the past. At the end of the demonstrations of May 15th, which is also now the name of the movement, May 15th, uh, both in Madrid and Barcelona, a few people, like 20, 30, decided to camp in the main squares of the cities to um, discuss about what to do. Okay, we protest, and then what? Um, and then when they found themselves sleeping the air and discussing the air the whole night, they started to tweet to their friends so the following day they were not tens but hundreds and then the hundreds treated their friends and then the following day there were thousands and that kept growing. So the movement as such started with a big premise. The most important thing is to change the institutions, the political institutions that do not represent us. In that sense, they echoed all this public opinion perception that we are powerless because our representatives do not represent us. And that's overwhelming feeling in the entire Europe and actually very much also now in the United States after the crisis with the trust in Obama. What happened in Portugal? What happened in Portugal was a movement called Geração Arrasca uh, that took the streets. But before taking the streets, it took the social networks. Um, it was fooled by uh, what happened in a given moment in a concert hall. A group called Yulinda singing a song, which would be translated to English, How Stupid I Am, telling the story of a young generation of people without really, with lots of hopes, but without real means to achieve their hopes.
the social networks allowed for the song to be passed first, then the traditional media, television, radio and newspapers started giving attention to the event and then we had 300,000 people on the streets of several Portuguese cities. There is a big banner. The banner said, we are slow because we go far. And that's the feeling. This is a big beginning. This is a new beginning. That's aftermath. The aftermath of the crisis is not only the social devastation, it's not only the political crisis, it's not only Greece going down, it's also an aftermath in terms of the reconnection between society and the political system. This notion that the political parties are eternal, that the political system is always the same, is a self-serving notion for people to be scared about the political emptiness. However, between the current moment, with total distrust, total disaffection vis-à-vis -vis the political system, and the reconstruction of a new form of politics, not of new parties, there is a long historical transition, and many dangerous things can happen during that time. And therefore, uh, what people in the movement are thinking these days, that, well, in the meantime, let's be together. Let's trust each other. And if we are together, we create a new economic culture based on trust, respect, tolerance, and togetherness. And from there, we can wait, because we don't need the institutions to save our lives. Our lives are saved by ourselves. And from there, we will have time to reconstruct the institution. It's a little bit utopian, but at least give me an alternative, uh, because the other alternative is to rush into creating a new party in the next six months, which will be the same, because we'll be in the same system. The question, the really big question, is about the state, and whether the state is a source of solidarity that helps citizens, or is mainly organized as a support for the global capitalist system. We have to prepare um, for this situation where things are getting worse and also that the centre of the world is, is no more in Europe or in the United States and um, the centre of the world um, has already shifted and um, this is going to affect all of us. We are between, really between two different reactions. People who are trying to go back and people who are trying to discover what the future could be. What doesn't work anymore is the present for anybody. <laughs>